Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, Book of Titus. We're going to begin here with chapter 2 in a moment. Remember, the theme for the book of Titus was said in the 15th verse of chapter 1. And it goes, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. That, that says it all. You're going to find in the second chapter that God is very specific. When you understand His Word, it is, it is specific, it is to the point, and it gives you correct doctrine, and don't ever let anyone take that away from you. It is God's love for you that He sent His Son in His, in His stead as Emmanuel, God with us, to pay that price so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be pure. That is to say, we all fall short, but when you repent, you're pure. And to you, all things are pure. That's a mindset that is very important in carrying forth the Word of God. So, having said that, Titus, meaning protected, you find out in Galatians chapter 2, verse 3, that uh, Titus was a Greek. And Paul had sent him to Crete, which was which Crete being about 140 miles long and 30 miles wide, to establish churches, to set officials in those churches, but to be specific in what you would have those officials teach. And naturally, what was it they were to teach? Not their word, but the word of God. Chapter 2 and verse 1, and it reads, But speak, or teach, he refers to Titus, thou the things which become sound doctrine. Don't you go off into any tangents? Don't you listen to any false teachers, prophets? You stick with the word, and you stick with it, I mean, religiously. That is to say, strictly spiritually, our Father's word. Sound doctrine is teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse and explaining in detail precisely the Father's emotions, decisions, and judgments. Verse 2, that the aged men be sober, that, that's, that's to, be, to be sensible, grave, that means honorable, temperate, that means having a lot of patience, sound in faith, and that means not wishy-washy, not this way one minute or that way one minute or going by what men say, but what God says, sound doctrine. And in charity, that means in love, love of God. If you do not have love of God, there's no way you can ever teach. If you do not have love of God, there's no way you can get along with people. And in patience to rounded out. Uh, <clears throat> they must be vigilant in the Word and carry it forth. The aged men would be the elders he's setting forth in the church. That is to say, who, who would teach the Word, would explain the Word, would fulfill the Word, and keep it what sound doctrine. And doctrine, are the, are, that is the teachings of God through the Son, in detail, and, and with these other um, characteristics added to this, it's precise. Verse 3, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, that they, they love Father, and they <clears throat> do that, that is uh, honorable, not false accusers, that means not a lot of gossiping or spreading bad word, nor given to much wine, a little wine for the good of the tummy, as Peter says, but not a wine bibber, teachers of good things. 
this is always think positive. That's what he's saying. If you want to be pleasing to God, you are going to think positive. It's real easy to be negative about everything. And if you're not real careful, when you're negative about everything, you're letting your flesh speak, not your spirit body. It's your flesh body that's talking. You, you want to be, you want to say good things when it is at least possible and believe in that and be teachers of good things. And of course, there's nothing better than the Word of God to teach, to correctly uh, add to uh, discipline and uh, to hold people, hold them by not fear, but by the love of God. It is, if you're going to be a successful teacher with the sound doctrine of Almighty God, you're not going to hold people by fear, teaching a God that is out to zap somebody every time they make a miss move. No, God loves His children. God is very forgiving, and He resents those that would take advantage of His children. But why? Because He's a loving Father. Don't, don't ever let anyone take that away from you. You cannot read these scriptures, which are from our Father. You cannot read them without recognizing the fact our Father is a God of love. That he loves His children. He gives them every opportunity as long as what? As long as you stay in sound doctrine. As long as you have that charity, that is to say that love foremost, and that you're a teacher of good things, not junk not traditions of men. Verse 4, listen carefully. That they may teach the young women to be sober. That means to be wise, to make wise decisions. To love their husbands and to love their children. <clears throat> now, in telling you how specific our father is, this word husbands here, is not the normal word in the Greek used for husband. And I must call it to your attention, the word used here is philandros. And, and uh, well, what does philandros is husband? Yeah, it's a very special husband. It, spe it puts specifics on this verse. Example. If you have a husband who beats you, knocks your teeth out, harms the children, you're to love him? Would God give us that kind of instruction? Of course not. Then you're not being specific, and that's why you need to understand the Greek word husbands in philandros. Philandros, you, you know what? Philadelphia means, it means the city of brotherly love. And philandros means a husband that loves. A husband that loves his family, a husband that loves his children, a husband that provides for his family, then the wife should love him. He puts, he is very specific. He puts boundaries on the word of getting along and having peace. A woman married to a fool, if she listens to him, is a bigger fool than he is. And I'm not trying to cause trouble in families. But the thing is, if we go back, here, here we have Timothy, right before this. If we go back to uh, Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, but if any provide not for his own, this is a husband, and specifically of those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So you see, God is very specific. So when a woman has a husband of love, that is to say a, a husband that provides for the family, that takes care of the family, then she should love him. Love in return. Then you have a solid Christian family, a family of faith. It is very important. As a matter of fact, in the last, uh, last lecture, I had a letter from a lady, and I'm not mentioning any names or states, but her husband beat her so bad, and yet somebody, he had put her on such a guilt trip that if she didn't come back to him, she was disobeying God. And she knew if she went back to him, he would kill her. 
So you see, he was not a philandrist. Certainly had, would not match that at all. I, I use that example to show you that God is specific. God doesn't expect you to be unequally yoked. And um, this is, the, but that you should have a loving family. Every family has problems. But do you know how you work those problems out? If, there, if it's even the least possibility that you can get along is with God. And when one refuses God, then it makes that very difficult because you don't have a husband of love then. You have a husband of something else. This is why our father is so specific. And to love their children, that is just as normal as it can be for a real mother. A mother will do for a child it is a beautiful thing to see a mother and a child and how that mother loves that child. Verse five, to be discreet, that means be sensible, use common sense, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And so it is to be discreet and to use good judgment to work as the family unit, a family that works together, a family that studies God's word together, was a family that will stay together. It is a family that will be blessed of God. Our father, again, he's very specific, and that's why he gives us these rules. Verse 6, young men, likewise exhort to be sober-minded. You, young men, you be able to practice self-control. It is in youth, there's many times you can get some pretty scattered ideas. And we all have to learn from maturity of growing up, of how to react and interact, how to gain by experiences, but most of all, to, to, to practice self-control, the sober-minded. How, how best can you practice self-control? Common sense. You know what is right and you know what is wrong. And as long as you practice self-control, you're going to have um, people that will come along and say, try this and try that and try this way and try that way. Take a good look at them. See how they're doing with it. If their eyes, if their old pupils are dilated and they look all messed up, you don't want to go there. That's idiocy. Don't want any part of that. If, if a person, you know, the most beautiful feeling in the world is to feel the touch of the living God. What a high. What a beautiful feeling to hear that, feel that love and understanding and charity that God brings into our families and our homes. Practice self-control to stay in that. And you will be a very wise young man. You will not be... Uh, led off into the ways of the world, which certainly God will never bless, and you're never going anywhere. Again, when you as a young person start planning your life, and remember what we read back in chapter 5, 1 Timothy, verse 8, if you don't take care of your own family, you're worse than an infidel. Do you understand where that puts you in the eyes of God? You're in pretty bad shape. Practice self-control. Use common sense. Don't be drawn aside by some fool or idiot. Verse 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptibleness. Gravity, that means honesty, and sincerity. Common sense and in being very sincere in what you do. Don't play church. Don't play that you love God. Either you do or you don't. And, and that pattern in your life is a good thing to have, to follow that pattern. The pattern set forth by good works, by sound doctrine by a loving family, and by the people around you earn their love by leading, directing, guiding, 
cooperating and being a good citizen of the community. Verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. In other words, protect your credibility. When you teach God's Word and, and in your own life, don't give anybody an advantage of being able to say something bad about you unless it's a lie. That you can't, you can't work with that too much other than mark that person and mark them as a false accuser because that's what they are. But always using common sense and sound doctrine um, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. Well, what is he talking about? The Word of God. And you following in the footsteps of those that have gone on before us and setting those standards and ways that bring happiness. And most of all, you know, in this world, we as Christians are here, but we have a great, great advantage if you take advantage of it. Our Father blesses us. You have that advantage to always succeed to have that <clears throat> reputation that no one can really find anything against you. They may try to talk against you, but then when it's proven that they're a liar, they have nothing but shame in their lap. So your credibility is a very important thing because you are a Christ man. You are a man, a woman, or a child of God. And let it be said wherever you walk. There goes a child of God by your actions and by your ways. That Father always takes care of his own and that uh, when you protect your own credibility, you see, when it comes to people hearing you and listening to you, that's when your credibility is so very valuable. You cannot play both sides of the fence. That's not to say we're all, not all going to make mistakes at time. We will. But on repentance, it's totally forgiven. Get it straight. Get back in the walk with Almighty God. Know that He loves you enough. It's forgiven. And protect that credibility whereby people will pay heed to your advice. Pay heed to your counsel. And when you want your perfect counsel, let it be the Word of God, for it is perfect. Your way in presenting it, presenting it is sound speech that you'll never have to apologize for because God's Word always, I do mean always, comes to pass exactly as it's written. <clears throat> Verse 9, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. And answering again means gainsaying, just yippity, 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 always, crazy, always complaining, just blah, 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 okay? Never quite happy. Hey, listen, if um, servants, when you're hired in a job and you're doing it, don't, don't, whoever's hiring you, do what they say. That's what you're being paid for. That's your contract. That's your reputation. As, as long as it is decent and honorable, and don't badmouth him about it. You're taking his 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 salary. You, you are are um, a worker for that organization, whatever it might be, business job. And if you will do a better job than anyone else, you won't stay there long. You'll move up, 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 and up. Why? Because God blesses those that do it His way. So. Here you have a perfect example. Whatever you do, don't be a gainsayer, a answering again and again. That's a good way to be without a job. That's a good way that nobody wants you necessarily. Okay. Always just bickety, bickety, picky, picky, picky. All right. Be happy with what you're doing. Make it better. Always make your life better and make it better for those around you and you will move up and up. That's what's important. That's 
Well, what is that called? God's blessings. Verse 10. Not purloining, lining, that means stealing. Don't take anything or credit for anything that isn't yours. But showing all good fidelity, that means conviction and, and uh, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Um, in other words, when, when you bring forth that good doctrine and when you live it, you have God's blessings in every way. Uh, you just, you know, this is the love of Almighty God for His children. And I know some are going to say, well, I, it never blesses me that way. Well, what do you do? do you, are you concise in following His advice here? Because if you are, uh, you're blessed. If not, I can tell you right quick what your problem is. You've got to do it His way. Self-control, love, loving family, loving God, producing in the community, teaching a good word, living a good word, whereby your credibility is right on top and no one can say anything against you, so everybody will listen to you, basically. Everybody that loves God. So never, never take that that isn't belonging and always um, be convincing in God's Word that it is true and that it is a blessing to all that take hold of it, to all that will adhere to it. You don't have to take any shortcuts. All you have to do is be honest in good sound doctrine, the Word of God, and God will always bless you whereby it is marked and, uh, and uh, the, that doctrine that God is is our Savior in all things. Well, what, what, how many things again was that? All things. He has an answer for everything. The truth will set you free. I know you have certain Christians that will say, well, there's some things God will not forgive you for. Well, if you want to listen to a liar, listen to him. But isn't it better to listen to God's word? All things. There is only one unforgivable sin, and if you're not one of God's elect, you never even have to worry about it anyway because it doesn't apply to you. And it doesn't happen until after the false Christ appears on earth. But to be fair in bringing forth the truth whereby people can amplify in their lives that truth that blesses, that grows, that is so catching that it brings you into the saving power of Almighty God, which means His blessings rain down on your family and bless you and those that you come in contact with. Verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That word grace, as you well know, is charis. And it is the charis and the charisma, the love and the forgiveness of Almighty God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. In what way? In Christ, the very Son, who loved you enough that He paid that price on the cross, that knowing you're going to fall short. I wish I could say that we could all just be perfect. But we're, we're in flesh, and flesh is not perfect. But praise be to God, His love for us and our love for Him, He forgives and gives us a fresh start when we do fall short. That's what a Savior is. That's what salvation is, is to reach to you and lift you and bring you into His saving charis, His charisma, His love his blessings. You know, to be in good standing with the living God is an awesome, awesome thing. And the reason he's very specific and puts boundaries on things, such as a husband that we were doing earlier, is so that you have common sense and being able to ascertain and to determine what it is God would have you do. Do you know what it always comes back to? Honesty, straightforwardness, but most of all, 
truth, truth in God's word that always brings forth blessings and understanding that surpasses all things of this world. Stay in his word, stay in sound doctrine, and you will always, always be blessed. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, that means honestly, righteously and godly in this present world. Um, in, don't, don't, don't read over that. Not only in this world, but as it was for God's elect, even in the first earth age. But in, in this dispensation of time, you don't have to wait till heaven to gain the knowledge and the wisdom and the blessings of God. You can bring it. It comes to you in this world, in this present world, in this present time, with our present Father. He's here, but you've got to reach out to Him. You've got to let Him know that you love Him. You've got to let Him know that you follow Him and that you not only enjoy the blessings, but that you love Him for it because that's what He wants from you is your love. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I feel that time is very soon. We know we've got some rough spots in the road for some people, but if you are in the walk with God, you know that, be, that being witnessing against the false Christ is a piece of cake. Why? Because the Holy Spirit witnesses through you does it for you, whereby not a hair on your head can be touched. And looking forward to the second advent is a beautiful thing. You know, well, well, how could you say that, dear brother, that looking forward to it is a blessed thing? Because a lot of people fear it, but they kind of fear in ignorance. Like, he's coming back to judge and I'm frightened. Well, no. If you're doing his work according to these scriptures, you're blessed. Okay. He's, his judgment to you is, is to move you further up the ladder, to bring you blessings and happiness forever. That is that hope. That is sure and earnest hope in him, knowing that we have that before us. And that's why you look forward to that day, because it is a good day. It is the day that we can take Satan and tromp him right into the ground, as spiritually speaking, and make him look like what he is before your brothers and sisters that are just a little bit ignorant of what God's Word truly says. By the very words from your mouth with the Holy Spirit doing the speaking. That's why you can look forward with joy to that time, that day and the work that you must do even before that appearing, whereby you are blessed. 14, who gave himself, listen carefully, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. What, what is this purify unto himself a peculiar people? You remember the theme I told you back in verse 15 of chapter 1? Unto the pure all things are pure. He wants you to be pure by loving him. Now what is this he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity? Oh, They've got it wrong. I mean, you know, there are teachers that say if you're divorced, you're penalized. You can't do this and you can't do that. And if you if you do this and you know, you it's a no no. You can't, you know, you can't do. I don't care if you repent. You're not forgiven. Don't let some false religion come into your heart. It says very clearly, all sin. He forgives all sin. And when you repent, he paid an awesome price to redeem you from that. 
So don't you let some offbeat, would-be so-called religionist rob you by causing you to be helped by fear and moved to the back of the church because you're not good enough to be up front. That's a false teaching. False apostles. All sin is forgiven. He's not a halfway savior. He's not a savior that can only, he's just so weak, he can't get this done. He is powerful, all forgiving. And don't you ever let anyone take that away from you. Do you see how precise the word of God is when you explain it? Good doctrine, good sound doctrine. That peculiar people is a people that are purity bound. They mess up a little bit, but hey, that's all right. He forgives us. Why? Because he loves you. Verse 15 to complete the chapter. These things speak, or these things you teach and exhort, you correct by them and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. In other words, don't you allow some knucklehead to come in on the side and start teaching false doctrine, crippling Christ's very saving power with his nonsense. You rebuke and correct. That's edit. I mean, you edit out junk. You get it out of your church. You get it out of your congregation. Well, dear brother, God is a God of love. Love is tough love. It means to get rid of junk. You do not let a tender one be abused by some crackpot that claims to be a man or woman of God. You don't, you rebuke. Well, well Jesus was a Jesus of love. Jesus planted a, a whip of nine, a cat of nine tails and laid it to the back of the money changers and the people in the very house of God that didn't belong. That's authority. Why? Because he didn't, because he loved the children that tried, that wanted to do what's right. So a true man or woman of God makes a stand and you stand against falseness. You teach a sound doctrine. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldea, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. That 1-800-643-4645, that number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We're not going to judge people. Hey, you don't have to. God is the judge. And he judges rough enough on his own. So... Simply straight, real doctrine. That's what's important. If you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? You that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. And um, it's always a pleasure. Now, you got a prayer request? You do not need that number and you don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. Do you, do you understand he created you different than anyone else? You're unique. 
different DNA, fingerprints. He wanted somebody like you, but he wants you to love him. He has a destiny and a purpose for every soul, and, um, and he loves every one of them. Let him return that love and be blessed. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. Let's go with Jesse from Florida. Question on Revelations chapter 6, verse 6. Uh, Hurt not the oil and the wine. What is the oil and wine? And um, I've tried to, to look it up in the Strong's. Well, let's, let's, what, what does the whole verse say? A penny for barley. It means you're going to work all day for the price of a loaf of bread in the end. You know, we've just about come to that. And then don't hurt the oil or the wine. The oil is the oil of our people. It's olive oil. In the Hebrew, uh, Eliyah. And it means um, the, the wine being the blood of Christ. Don't hurt that perfect teaching. That's exactly what it means. Uh, Mark from Miss New Jersey. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What hast thou done? And the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And does that mean at that time Abel was with the Lord and was God trying to get Cain to tell him what he had done? Yes, yeah, life is in the blood, and uh, so to speak. But he was already with the father. The father knew, but he was nailing Cain. This, therefore, you can read in St. John chapter 8, verse 44, he was the first murderer in the beginning, and his father was the devil. That's what God wanted him to know and knew that God knew. Um, Debbie from Oklahoma. I understand that angels in heaven help God to execute his purpose. They're messengers, yep. Could it be that angels sometimes intervene for us, such as keeping us safe during a tornado or protecting as in a car accident? Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, what does it say? If you're one of God's elect, or saints, I should say, that means set aside one, same thing. It says that your angel has the face of God at any time you need him. So that pretty well, it's, it's a very comforting thing to know. Our Father watches over His anointed. That's very important. Again, that scripture is Matthew 18, verse 10. Uh, Cecilia from California. I pray I'm not doing wrong. Please help me with scriptures on this. I know my sister's life is crumbling around her. I am so very blessed, very every single day. Please remember us in your prayer. You've got it, and you're not doing wrong. Um, when someone splits a family, then your scripture in relationship to this to let you know you're not doing wrong is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, begin reading with verse 6. And that's the way you treat her, is as it is written. I'll say it one more time. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Verse 6, start reading there. Uh, Dylan, Dylan from Wisconsin. Um, three questions. If, first, if I am one of God's elect, how will I know? Well, if you know the false Christ is coming first, probably pretty well you are because you're going to stand against him. Second, I've heard about three earth ages. Was the one we're in right now created at Genesis or earlier? wasn't created, it was started, it began. The earth was created in the first earth age, but it was rejuvenated and brought to this particular place after the overthrow, which was total destruction. A third, if I am one of God's elect, I've been confused, was I alive in the first earth age before this one? We were all with God. Where did you come from? You didn't come out from under a rock out here somewhere. Naturally, you were with him. And he created all souls at the same time, as it's written, as wisdom speaks in Proverbs 8. John from Minnesota. I've been studying horses of the Bible. Pastor Murray said he will be riding a white horse. Does that mean 
he will come back in a bronze vehicle. It will, uh, he will return as a supernatural. And the reason the white horse is issued in 6-6, six, six, and that happens to be the Antichrist, the white horse rider in Revelation chapter 19 is the true Christ. Why? Because the false Christ is a fake. He's a copier. He tries to make himself look like the real Christ. And do you know something? He was the most beautiful of the archangels. God states in Ezekiel 28, I made you the full pattern. He earned it. And then he went bad. But he's very convincing and he's able to perform miracles. Why? He's supernatural. And a, a person that is not familiar, God has been very precise in letting us know exactly what goes down and what we're supposed to do. And people that haven't read that, they're going to be in a heap of hurt when that comes to pass. Uh, Tara from Missouri. Could the Comforter be here now? Oh, the Comforter, dear, has been with us uh, since, um, since Christ promised the Comforter in the 40th day after his resurrection. He said to the disciples, do not leave Jerusalem until you receive what I have promised, which was the Comforter. And it happened on Pentecost Day that the Holy Spirit is the Comforter. The Holy Spirit teaches us through the Word, gives us unction and knowledge, whereby when you pray for it and you need help, God will always give it to you in one form or the other. When, when you are trying to do God's work, He will help you. He will furnish the bricks, but you've got to do the building. <clears throat> and I'm speaking spiritually. Uh, Kimberly from Tennessee. Being a college student, you make it so easy to stay in our Father's Word every day. I have a friend who smokes pot and insists there is nothing wrong with that. This really upsets me. What can I tell him? Thank you very much. Well, mark that person. You know, that's, that, you're supposed to use good judgment, and certainly that person isn't. Um, the, it, still, one thing leads to another. And when you're that careless, you might say, well, it, how could it harm? It's against, number one, it's against the law. Okay. And anytime you become a lawbreaker, you're sticking your neck out. You're going to get your reputation shot right down the tubes. And because you're going to get caught sooner or later. You know, the stuff stinks. It smells. You, you, you know when, you know, it's, it's, it's not that big a thing. You're not hiding anything. So um, even though if it, if it didn't hurt, and I feel it does, because one thing leads to another, you've got to have something stronger, more a lick, give me something that just really will jar you, need that big lift. Well, Christ is that lift, that Holy Spirit that goes through us. You, you are, you're very blessed. You be very sincere and you think about it. Uh, Lisa from Oklahoma. I've watched your program, thank you, um, and my question is this. In Revelation 7, it speaks of the 144,000 sealed, and then in 7-9, it speaks of a multitude that no one could number or who had washed their robes, or are these the dead from the tribulation? No, no, no. It's right now. What have they washed their robes in? Go back and read it again. The blood of Christ. So it means that either when Christ went to paradise and preached, or as it's written in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, or all your grandparents and everyone else that has passed on that were Christian, they're there. This 144,000 are just sealed to do a job of teaching, period. And they have to be. They are not God's elect. But they are people that need to be sealed. But there's a multitude of people. They're not out here in some hole in the ground. That's the teachings of Christ. Instantly, to be absent from this body is present with the Lord. And they're there and quite happy, except if you're on the right side of the gulf. Pauline from Florida. Is Christ or God physically described? If God made man in his image, why does it say 
He has eyes as flames of fire and so forth that does not uh, describe man. It's a figure of speech. He can see through things. He knows all things. He's, he, he's, he's a mind reader. He's our father. He's supernatural. And naturally, um, what did God say in the garden? Let, let us create man in our image. And Christ would say in John chapter 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? He was in the perfect image. Because it was God with us. Okay. If there is no rapture, where does God judge and open the book of life? If he does this in heaven, then we must all be there. Uh, God is coming here to earth. The great white throne judgment will take place right here. And um, God will set his eternal temple right here on earth. It's written in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Have you read it? Uh, Curtis from California. Are the two witnesses Elijah and Moses? It would seem who showed up, who appeared with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 11? Well, it was Moses and Elijah. Moses the law and Elijah the prophets. The very word of God and the word of God himself, Christ. Walk, became flesh, walked among us. So <clears throat> why would he have those two appear with him on the Mount of Transfiguration? I think we can pretty well figure that out. Sue from Virginia. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14 through 18. Please explain these scriptures. Thank you. Sue, you can't do that. You can't explain 14 through 18 without going back to 13 where it starts. It gives you the subject. I don't want you to be ignorant like the heathen. I want you, if you believe Christ resurrected from the dead, you better believe all that are dead have resurrected also and are with him. Uh, so, uh, in other words, what it's talking about is where the dead are. They're already gone. That's why the living cannot precede the dead. Why? Because they're already out of here. But then on the seventh trump, we are all changed into that breath of life body. That's what the air, word air in the Greek manuscripts means there, not sky or atmosphere. It means breath of life. Uh, that's what it means. At the seventh trump, Christ will return, and we will have already witnessed against the false Christ. And it lets you know where the dead are. Uh, okay, Joe from, Joe's from Kentucky. Thank you for being there for us. I need to know, can the devil fool us into thinking we are in spirit form when he tries to say he is Christ? If so, how? He can't do it. Flesh is flesh, is flesh and it's, it's like uh, flesh is anchored by gravity. A spirit body does not have that. It's free from uh, the pull of gravity. And... Uh, uh, as we know it in this 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 dispensation, this this um, uh, body, so he he cannot do that. He's there's many things he can do, but that is one thing he cannot do, and will not do, because flesh unfortunately is pretty easy to identify. It's painful. It gets old. It gets sick. In the spirit body, you're perfect as far as as, uh, as being is concerned. Your soul might still be mortal, but your body is perfect and spiritual in that particular body. Soul being mortal means it's still liable to die at judgment, but you, you have, you're still in a spiritual body. Floyd from Mississippi, where would I find that Arab or Arabian means locust, arba? Well, it's real simple. Do you have a Strong's Concordance? Look up the word Arabian and look up the word locust. It's that simple. It's just that uh, with the vowel there, it's the same word. And where is the swarm today? You go to the Euphrates, the river, and look east, and you see the swarm. It's there. Charlene from Louisiana. Why is it when you get older and disabled, people think less of you? Does that mean God thinks less of you? Absolutely not. I, I, I know that some people do not have patience with seniors, and that's a, that's a shame. 
That's really a shame. Uh, uh, Charlene, probably if you can remember, and uh, maybe you're not my age, but it, when I was a young person, you were taught to respect elders. You, I mean, you went out of your way to help them, to assist them, to make sure they had what they needed. If it was crossing the street or something else or opening a door for them, I know that much of that has slipped away because discipline is not taught, and that's the love of God. But God doesn't change. God loves his children, and I don't care what age you are, you're, you're a child of God. And he truly loves his children. Charlene, God loves you, and you know something? We do too, so you, you just hang tough. Annie from Oklahoma. Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, is there anywhere else that says this is Satan? Oh, lots of places. First of all, that's the first, the first um, uh, go-round there of seals, which means it's the first thing in your mind God wants you to know. Of all the seven seals, Knowing the Antichrist comes first is the number one in your mind. You want to have that uh, anchored. But the next place you find it, there's lots of places. But mainly, I, one of the best places I feel where it really just gets right down precisely to the point is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul says, hey, that first letter I wrote to you in the fourth chapter about gathering back to him might have fooled a lot of people, deceived. They didn't understand. Don't worry. It's not going to happen, our gathering back to the true Christ, until after the son of perdition, that's this rider on the white horse, stands in the holy place claiming to be God. So he comes first before the true Christ. That is, that is so important to know that. Why? Because it keeps you from being deceived by Satan himself claiming to be Christ. That is a message that of all times needs to be taught at this time. Because it is, you know, how embarrassing it would be to finally have to face Christ and know you'd been in bed with Satan before you did because you were ignorant of God's word. You didn't know the Antichrist was coming first. And over and over and over in his letter, his doctrine, he warns us about that. If you've read God's word, you know the Antichrist is coming first. And to be delivered up at that final hour and to know you're no longer a virgin bride, your past history, you can't participate in the wedding because you didn't read God's word. He warned and he sets it aside. That's how important it is. It comes right down to that point. Uh, Sue from Arkansas, will we be in spirit form or flesh in the millennium? Also, will we be here on earth when Satan is? Absolutely, and we'll be in flesh when Satan is here. In the millennium, we are in spirit bodies. When does that happen? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, at the furthest out trump. That's what the Greek says. What is that? It's the seventh. The sixth is when the Antichrist comes. The seventh is when we are changed into spiritual bodies and go through the millennium. Now, at the sixth trump, when the Satan comes, we're still in flesh bodies. We're walking this old earth, and we are God's elect that know we must stand against him. That we're not to premeditate what we will say beforehand, but he will give it to us at that time as it's written in Mark 13. Some of you have a destiny, and you've known since you were a child there was more to God's word than you had been taught. Read Mark 13 and read it carefully and know you're going to be delivered up before the false one, but you can cut it. God loves you. Sherry from Oklahoma, how can I get to know the Lord better so I can stand up against Satan? It's real simple. Talk to him. Talk, he'll talk to you through his word. 
When you study His Word, you become a proficient worker for the living God. You become a, pro a proficient soldier for the truth in standing against Satan. It's putting on the gospel armor, every detail of it, to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. You read Ephesians 6, Sherry, and, and, and bring it into your being and know and put every piece of that on because we don't war against the flesh of the arm. We war against supernaturals in, from higher places, meaning cast from heaven to earth. But we can cut it. Why? Because we're children of God. We are God's elect. Marie from Oklahoma. When you order Satan out in the name of Jesus Christ, how many times do you need to do it? It seems like I have to keep doing it over again. You know, many times if you invite somebody into your home and they happen to be packing a, an evil spirit, you invite it in. And you have to, what you have to do is anoint and prevent anything coming in piggyback. But there's nothing wrong with re-anointing the home. That's fine. But when, it, when you need it, when you feel it's uh, evil, anoint and then order it out. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy God's word. Most of all, God loves you for it, makes his day. When you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings if we have helped you. You help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God, and he will always bless you. But there's one thing that's most important, though, and it's this. You stay in his word every day, and his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.